Okay, let's get started. Hi, uh, my name is Maris Kreisman, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. Please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for your questions, so start thinking about them now. You can use the Zoom chat function to submit any questions you have, and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. We're glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our store locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep posting more of them, please buy books from us. Throughout the evening, I'll be posting links in the chat to buy Infinite Country from McNally Jackson, as well as A Burning. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, your authors for tonight. Um, Patricia en Engel is the author of The Veins of the Ocean, winner of the Daytona Literary Peace Prize. It's Not Love, It's Just Paris, winner of the International Latino Book Award. And Vida, a finalist for the Penn Hemingway and Young Lions Fiction Awards, New York Times Notable Book, and winner of Columbia's National Book Award. Her stories appear in The Best American Short Stories, The Best American Mystery Stories, The O. Henry Prize Stories, and elsewhere. Born to Colombian parents, Patricia teaches creative writing at the University of Miami. And um, we're so thrilled to be celebrating the release of Infinite Country with her tonight. And joining us, we're so thrilled to have Mega Majumdar, who was born and raised in Kolkata, India. She moved to the US to attend college at Harvard University where she was a Traub scholar, followed by graduate school in social anthropology at Johns Hopkins University. She works as an associate editor at Catapult and lives in New York City. And A Burning is her first book. It's a thrill to see both of you and um, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Maris. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I read Infinite Country last fall, actually, when Alex Prumiani, who I think is here, who is a star publicist, sent me a galley with a really beautiful note. And I tore through this powerful book. It's, you know, what I love about this book is that it resists this simple narrative of immigration. Um, it looks directly at the regrets, the sacrifices, the loss of home that comes with migration. Um, it's Reese Witherspoon's pick for her book club. It's a time best book of the month. It has praise from NBC Latino and Oprah Magazine and a million other places, um, but that's probably enough from me. Why don't we start with you, Patricia, introducing the book in your own words. Uh, first, thank you so much, Mega, for being here with me tonight because I love your book. A burning so much that I taught it to my graduate students last semester when it's hot off the presses. And I'm so grateful that you agreed to be here and that you were an early reader of Infinite Country. So it means so much to, me, um, to be here with you tonight. So Infinite Country is the story of a Colombian family fractured by immigration and deportation. And it takes place over 20 or so years beginning in the late 1990s. And um, it is, sort of a portrait or a chronicle of a family who's having this collective experience of being a family in the process of emigrating, but also you get into the personal experiences of each of the five family members, the two parents and the three children who each um, are located in a different place on this spectrum of statuses assigned to people as a result of ever-changing immigration laws. So it's, a, it's a novel that explores how a family remains a family across time and distance and borders and with so much uncertainty and how love um, transcends all that. You mentioned that every person in this family has a different status. There's a character who gets deported. Um, there are kids who are born in the US and they are citizens. Um, there are characters who start off undocumented and gain legal status. What drew you to write about a mixed status family? Well, 
Um, the fact is most families where there are an, there's an undocumented family member are mixed status families, meaning that there might be citizen family members. And also status is something that can change overnight, the day your documents expire, perhaps, or when they don't get renewed, perhaps after years and years of being renewed. So it's something really that could almost happen to anybody you might almost find yourself being in a mixed status family. It's the reality of so many people that I know and have known in my life, people close to me uh, that I love, my, my dearest ones. So um, it's just uh, you know, a story that, that's been with me all along and, and it's only in recent years when I decided to, to sit down and, and write it, the story of this family that's like so many that I know. Mm. And one thing that you mentioned which I thought was so subtle in the book is how this story moves us from um, the 90s kind of through 9-11 into what happens afterwards. Um, how did you write the effects of 9-11 on this family? Um, wow, that's a good question that nobody has asked me. And um, I think the reason why it was so important for me to portray what the turn of the millennium meant in terms of how um, immigration was radically and drastically reframed as a result of the events of 9-11 and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, which then gave way to ICE. And things were very different before that. There were a lot more amnesties, there were a lot more visas granted, asylum was given uh, more readily. And the 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 media or political or popular perception was not as it is or it has been in recent years where uh, immigrants have been sort of um, portrayed as a drain rather than as a resource. Um, so I wanted to show how that sudden shift and here you have a family who's undergoing the process over this period. The, the novel begins in the late 1990s and the, um, Elena and Mauro, the young couple with a baby, come to the United States in the year 2000. So they are here for the events that happened that of course changed so many lives. It happens that I was in New York for 9-11 too and I saw the smoke outside my window. So mm -hmm. it's something that I experienced very closely myself and being in New York City at that time, the energy changed instantly, right? So I, I was hoping to, to convey some of that through the eyes of this family. Yeah. And one thing that I was really struck by is how, so Elena, the wife and mother in this family, um, the book portrays her vulnerabilities as, as a woman immigrant, um, as well as her kind of vast capacities mm -hmm. as a woman in this situation. Um, you know, for instance, there's a scene, and this is early in the book and not giving anything away, but there's a scene where she's at the hospital to have a baby and um, the nurse suggests sterilization and, and it really alarms her. And she worries for a moment that they have done the procedure without her permission. Um, so I was so struck by that. How did you write Elena's concerns specifically as a woman in this situation? Um, the sad truth is I know people who've been through that very experience. Um, so it's just human work. It's the, it's the work of caring. And I, I think it's, it's pretty natural. It's uh, uh, some things that people find um, shocking are actually so normal. It's frightening, right? So something like that is, is so common. It's just that certain people aren't exposed to those sorts of things. Um, so the character of Elena, yeah, she's, she's, she's alarmed, but she's not so alarmed that she can't process what might have possibly happened to her. Um, but I'm always writing into the strengths of women. It always fascinates me, the, the resiliency of women, um, the power, the force, and how women are very much um, responsible for the destinies of, of their families and their loved ones in obvious and non-obvious ways. Mm. You know, you were speaking about how it's, it's horrifying, but um, normal. Um, reminded me of this other moment in the book where 
um, two characters are having a phone call. I'm trying, I'm trying to phrase this without giving anything away, but two characters are, are on a phone call and they talk about what's happening in the US. You know, they're talking about how, um, and they say, you know, there are cities with contaminated water supply, children killed by the police, communities left to fend for themselves after disasters. And it was really powerful reading this during the pandemic. So, you know, the US is no land of fantasies in this book. How did you write that layer of complexity? Again, that's facts. <laughs> you know, I didn't make any of that up. And it, it's funny that people sometimes say like, I, I didn't think of the US in that way. And I think, how could you not? And it, it doesn't mean you love your country any less in acknowledging your shortcomings. In fact, it's quite the opposite. That's how you love something more. Like with the people you care about in your family, your, your loved ones in your relationships, you love them knowing their flaws, right? And it's, that's, that's how love becomes something real and not diluted or false or superficial. So um, the fact that I'm writing into the truth doesn't mean that it's necessarily a critique, it's just truth. And I think that even though I write fiction, one of the responsibilities of fiction in a way is to write truth. But when I was researching my novel, The Veins of the Ocean, which was largely set in Cuba, and I spent a lot of time traveling there, one of the things that always struck me was how horrified they were by the things happening here. And that people, everyone has guns. And how, how can you sleep at night knowing anyone can own a gun? And when you think about it in that way, well, yeah, it's, it sounds pretty wild. Um, but, you know, that's, that's always something that interests me to, to um, write into. Yeah, and it's such, a, it's such an important um, nuancing of the discussion, right? Where you acknowledge that the people who are immigrating into this country are very aware of all the ways in which this can be a very dangerous country too. Um, so it's not like you gain peace of mind. And one of the characters says this, that you're not going to the U.S. to, to get money, you're going to get peace of mind. But even that is such a, such a fraught thing and not always, not always secure. Um, I know that you wanted to read for a tiny bit. Is this a good time to do it? Sure. <laughs> I'll just read a little bit from the beginning. Um, so I don't think I need to explain anything. Um, so here we go. It was her idea to tie up the nun. The dormitory lights were cut every night at 10. Locked into their rooms, girls commanded to a cemetery silence before sleep, waking at dawn for morning prayers. The nuns believed silence a weapon, teaching the girls that only with it could they discover the depths of their interior without being servants to the temptations of this world. To be fair, the nuns were not all terrible. Some Tadia liked very much. She even admired how they managed to turn the condemned penitentiary population into mostly orderly damitas. It was a state facility, a prison school for youth offenders, not a convent and no longer a parochial school. The lay staff reminded the sisters to aim for secularity, but on those missioned mountains, the nuns ran things as they pleased. During the day under the nuns watch, the girls practiced their downcast gazes. They attended classes, therapy sessions, meditation groups, completed chores, uniformed in gray sweats, hair pulled back, forbidden from gossip and touching, but they did both when out of sight. At night, in the blackness of the dormitory, they gathered to whisper in shards of window pane moonlight. When the nuns patrolled the hall outside their room, they became masterful mutes, reading lips, inventing their own sign language, moving quiet as cats, creeping like thieves. They listened for the nun's footsteps on the level below, sensing vibrations on the wooden floor planks. The search for rule breakers, disruptors, their guardians would schedule for punishment at daybreak. The night of the escape, the girls made purposeful noise. So the nun on duty would come tell them to be quiet. Sister Susanna was on the night shift. There were many latecomer nuns at the facility left over from some other failed life. 
the rumor was Sister Susanna was married and so her husband divorced her because she couldn't have children. The plan originated with Alia, or maybe her father deserved the credit. That afternoon, she was given rare permission to phone him from the administrative office. Family contact was restricted since the staff believed they could be a girl's worst influence. Talia hoped to hear Mauro say he found a way to free her, have her sentence lifted, paid a fine, or convinced one of the rich residents of the apartment building where he worked as a janitor to call in a favor on her behalf. One never knows who might be listening, especially in a quasi-jail for minors, some of whom were murderers on the verge. Talia and Mauro were careful with their words. He tried everything he said. There was nothing more he could do. She understood liberating herself from the prison and the country would be up to her. With the help of another girl, she spent an hour ripping bed sheets, twisting them tight as wire, thin as rope. She counted to 1,000 in the darkness, then gave the signal for the other girls to start shouting, fire, fire, fire. Sister Susana appeared in the doorway. Talia waited to catch her from behind with a pillowcase over her head. They'd cut breathing holes because they weren't trying to kill anyone, only to paralyze with fright. Talia held the nun while the others tied her to a chair with the shredded sheets, her breath hot on Talia's hands as another girl shoved a sock between her teeth to gag screams. When Talia arrived to the prison school a month earlier, Sister Susana had called her into her office and told the 15-year-old she'd studied her life, as if that file of police jottings and psychological assessments on her desk could reveal anything that mattered. You're not like other girls here, she began. Yes, I am, Talia wanted to say. She didn't want to be singled out, treated as an exception if it meant putting the other girls down. I believe it was your desire for justice that led you to do an awful thing, but you badly injured a man. You could have blinded him. A pause, the rattle of voices in the cafeteria down the hall. She knew Sister Susanna was waiting for a response, a denial perhaps, more likely an admission of guilt. The nuns were always scavenging for remorse. Do you want to change? With faith and discipline, anything is possible. Talia was not stupid, so she said yes. I'll stop there. That was great. Um, thank you so much, Patricia. I'm going to take a second and remind everyone that we will take questions in a few minutes. So please put them in the chat and I'll look at them soon. Um, I want to ask you about two things from what you just read. One is the opening line of this book, which is so striking. Um, it was her idea to tie up the nun. Um, how did you know that this is how the book would begin? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know, as a writer, I mean, sometimes sentences just show up in your brain, right? There's, there's the sentences where you start, you know, tinkering word by word and moving them around. And then there's others just arrive that arrive, right? They just kind of announce themselves. Mm -hmm. But the idea behind it actually came from um, a news headline, like, a, like a, this much, like three lines of a news story on some um, obscure news website I came across many, many years ago. And uh, it was about a group of adolescent girls who broke out of a juvenile detention facility in the hills of Colombia. And there were no details, no facts, no information, why, how, what happened or anything. But I was very taken by this image of young girls who just you know, so self-possessed and brave that they broke out of a prison <laughs> together. And I thought, well, that's something that I might return to. And as I started working on the story of this family for Infinite Country, that just worked itself in and, uh, and it just came to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, and, and Talia, you read this section um, about her. She is such a fascinating character. In many ways, she is um, a heart of the story. How, what was the process of building Talia? Um, I I'm, always have great fun writing extremely bold and fearless young women, right? Like uh, badass teenage girls. 
so fun because I was not at all a badass teenage girl. <laughs> I, was, I was, you know, much more quiet and just worried about writing in my journal and hanging out with my pets. But um, so it's fun. It's a lot of fun writing a character like that. But like I said, I was very taken by, by the ideas of these girls breaking out of a prison as happens in men's prisons frequently and disappearing into the mountains, a very volatile landscape. So I thought, wow, those, those girls have some, have some nerves. And I started to think about these girls. What, I mean, what would motivate a girl to do that? That's a very large risk. And I started to think what might be at stake for a girl like that. And, you know, the imagination uh, takes over at that point. And, and the story of Talia started um, to run on its own legs. She needed to get back to Bogota. There's a plane ticket waiting for her to be reunited with her mother and her siblings that she hasn't seen since she was a baby. So um, in a way, there's no more urgent story than that, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it just came from them. Um, I think a few new people have popped in. So I'm just going to remind everybody that we're talking about Patricia's new novel, Infinite Country, which is really beautiful. And you should buy it from McNally Jackson if you haven't already. Um, this is, you bring up the landscapes of Colombia and the myths and legends of Colombia are so present in the book. I was really fascinated by that. Can you talk about the role that they play in this story? Yeah, I think um, as I've gotten older and uh, a little side interest of mine is epigenetics. And, um, you know, I, I, in recent years, I've gotten really sort of interested in reading the ways that um, scientists have found that trauma is actually scientifically carried in the body, in the DNA. So much so that, um, you know, so many studies have been done for the descendants of Holocaust survivors in the ways that the trauma of those who survived the Holocaust manifest generations later. So this has always fascinated me. So moving from that, I started to think about the ways that the lands that made us us, that our ancestors occupied, how we carry that with us in ways that we are not even aware of either. In the same way we've already accepted we might carry trauma, why don't we carry love? Love for our homeland, you know, the, 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 the passion and the power of, of uh, our ancestors that are we're so connected to that particular landscape. So the Andean landscape where Bogota is very particular, that altitude, equatorial, it's just so specific. Bogota is my mother's hometown um, and where I have so much family. So I, of, of course I'm very familiar. And um, the characters in my story are, are leaving that. They have left that. And the place, it's their true point of origin. It's everything they have ever been in their family line was there, right? So when you leave that, of course, you have to take some of that with you. It's in you. Mm. So the mythology, or some people call it myth, and some people might call it ancestral uh, knowledge or traditional history. And you know, I think of it as true as, as any other story we tell about how the world or society came to be. So those are very specific to that region. And some I grew up knowing sort of um, uh, they must have been told to me so early that I don't even know how I knew them. Um, now others are just extensions of curiosity and research. But uh, I wanted to show that how we're a family, just like a country, a people, a society, and an individual. We are the sum of the stories that we have been told, that we have internalized, that we have accepted, and that we repeat to ourselves over and over. Yeah, I think you're... I think you're pointing to one of the main interests of this book as I read it, which is storytelling and stories. Um, it's, it's kind of woven into the structure of this book, this interest in storytelling. Um, and there's so much here about who gets to tell stories and when they tell a story, what do they hide? What do they protect? Um, I think those questions are just so beautifully beautifully present in the book. Um, 
let's see, I have so many questions. I'm looking at what to ask you next. Um, Okay, talking about leaving home and carrying those stories with you, there's a line where Elena talks about how happiness means different things in Colombia and in the US. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak on behalf of an entire country, you know, I'm just speaking on behalf of, um, of Elena and her upbringing, which is one that um, you know, maybe I, in, in my own ignorance, I identified as uh, very Colombian, but a good friend of mine um, who's Russian sh uh, shared with me a Russian proverb just the other day, which basically says the same thing. And she translated it. And um, so it's a very loose translation, but, but the essence of it is um, only fool, fools want to be happy, good people want to be useful. So, um, mm. you know, uh, that's a, a, a Russian saying, so, but it's really the same idea where you derive your joy and your happiness by what you're contributing to either your home or your loved ones or your community or the collective, not just this um, individualism where it's, what do I have to gain? What's benefiting me? It's, it's actually the opposite. It's what's benefiting the people I love. That's enough. That's what I have to gain, right? Yeah. So very different kind of thinking. And it's one that's so typical that I've seen, you know, just in my, in, you know, my, my extended family who are, who are all Colombian. Um, but I, I'm sure that it extends, you know, far and wide. I love that glimpse into the kinds of um, wisdom and just just these glimpses into the texture of various immigrants' lives. And, and what that reminds me of is also, and this is a pretty, this is a very minor scene in the book, but I think the, um, you know, people of the diaspora in the room will appreciate it. Um, there's this scene where Elena is calling home. She's calling her mother um, when they've newly arrived. And, you know, that scene is all about the lies that immigrants tell when they call home. You know, the ways in which you soften the truth. She doesn't say that they're staying with someone who locks the fridge and turns off the AC. You know, she tells her mother about the beautiful sun in Texas. So that choice that I think so many immigrants are so familiar with, that register of really intricate knowledge of the things that immigrants don't really talk about, but they all know that they do. Um, that was such an intricate and beautiful part of the book that I really appreciated. Thank you. I think you're right. There's so much about, well, so many people understand this experience, but there's still so many silences in, right? And that silence is really born, I think, from protecting the people you love. You know, you don't want them to know you're struggling or having a hard time because you know they'll worry. And, and absolutely and part of the same thing about deriving your happiness from, you know, uh, what you're contributing. And that's the other side of it is keeping things quiet so you're not spreading, you know, the, the pain. There's really, there's really interesting thinking through of borders in the book. Um, I'm so curious about how did your thinking about borders change perhaps as you were working on this book? I don't think it changed. I think it's something that I always felt and maybe because I was writing a book, I was forced to articulate it. <laughs> you know, it's um, um, when you think about borders and you think about what really the world is and the natural order of the world and that the human species um, is naturally designed to migrate and move in order to survive the same way that animals do, which is what we admire when we see animals do that. And you know, the animals will travel miles to find the watering hole, right? And we think, how magical that they know how to do that, right? Just so that they can continue to, to breed. And yet we haven't recognized that in ourselves, the human species, that humans do the same things to ensure their survival and the well-being of their families and their loved ones. And then when you think about, well, okay, in order to live on this planet, humans found a way to carve it up 
and put you know barriers and, and limitations and say this is where this land ends and this land begins and then you start to see the absurdity okay and you know sure they, they need to exist in some fashion but it's okay to acknowledge the way that they fall short of what human humans really need yeah yeah um and i think there's a line where one of the characters says that um actually i'm going to butcher it so i'm not going to say it but it's it's very much a, a pushing back against this idea that borders define who you are that your legal status has anything to do with the self that is the truest part of you um anyway it's in the book read it it's beautiful um i want to um change gears a little bit so this is your fourth book and this is perhaps a selfish question because i want to learn from you but what is what is a craft what is a craft question that was on your mind when you were working on this book or what is a craft lesson that you've learned as you've gone from book 1 to book 4 um it's funny cuz my my book 1 was a was a short book and then my books got longer <laughs> <laughs> now I came back to writing a short book. So I think somewhere in that space, I, w I went through this thing, you know, this is like deep, everyone's into decluttering. <laughs> I was like, what can I throw out? What can I throw out? What can I get rid of? What can I get rid of? And I just want to like, you know, slim it down and, um, and uh, make everything feel as urgent and as essential as possible. Um, I love a book that you can just lose yourself in for an extended period of time. I love long books too, but this story I felt like it needed to be short. You know, it's it's a family chronicle. It's a testimony of sorts. Um, it's a a witness document, and it needed to have that pare down urgency to it. So from a craft perspective, that's what I had to do. Just like take out my carving knife and. Dig, dig, <laughs> dig at the page <laughs> and um, strip it away. It is a very slim book, as Patricia says. It's slim but very mighty. Um, I think we have a couple questions coming in. Let me look at them from Anna O'Grady, who who is actually um, director of publicity at Simon and Schuster in Australia, and really wonderful. Hi, Anna. Um, loved both of your books. You are both brilliant writers. I wanted to ask you about writing about your home countries while living in another country. Do you think that it changes your perception on your home? Well, believe it or not, the United States is my home country. <laughs> I was born and raised here. I was born in New, New Jersey. It's a very glamorous place. <laughs> um, so, but the interesting part about that question is I still consider Colombia a home, even though I never lived there, right? And I think that's one of the fascinating things about um, how our thinking has changed. Um, so in diaspora is not just exiting your homeland and existing in orbit, right, somewhere else. But this idea of trans diaspora, where you can keep going back and reconnecting in your relationship among these two places is constantly evolving. My relationship with the United States, even though I've been here all my life, is constantly evolving, much in the same way that when I go back to Colombia, where I'm a daughter of diaspora, it's still, instead of locking myself into that, you know, mentality of, oh, I'm, I'm an outsider, or I'm, you know, an immigrant kid or whatever, I'm, I'm other, right? No, it's rejecting that other space and saying, no, there's this other space where we can exist, this, this fluid exchange, and we can be all things in new ways. And, it, and it's, a, it's an ever evolving condition, you know, being um, in, in a trans diasporic person. I don't, I think that's the first time I've heard um, trans diaspora. That is so interesting. And I love, and I love the implication that um, these migrations are not a splitting, not a fracturing, but um, a growth. You carry more with you. You bear more with you. Um, that is so beautiful. Um, and then, oh, wait. So 
I guess I can speak really quickly because Anna said for, for both of us, but um, for me, I, I grew up in India. And so of course I was writing from far away about home. And I think it, it sharpened my vision a little bit. I think it helped me pay attention to the details and pay attention to the um, movements and intricacies of um, emotional movement, you know, emotional precision in a scene, but also just the ways in which people behave, mannerisms, things that you see on the street. Um, what remained in my memories was, you know, the sharpest stuff, I think. Um, here's a question from Anissa, who is a wonderful supporter of books. Hi, Anissa. Um, for both authors, did books play a big part when you were a child? And if yes, do you believe that this reading shaped your decision to be a writer? Uh, um, in my case, yes, um, there were lots of books in my house always. Um, and my parents were really great about keeping me supplied with books. Um, but I also recall a time when I was very little when we ran out of books. So my father would just make up the stories <laughs> that he told <laughs> me before bed. So I don't know, you know, I, I have vague memories, but I guess that's where probably the recognition of storytelling being like this active process of invention maybe arrived. But as soon as I was able to put words together, I used to draw a lot as a kid. I thought I was gonna be an artist. As soon as I could um, like uh, spell, I would put captions on those pictures. And then the, picture, the captions became stories and the stories sort of took over and displaced the drawing. So I think I was, you know, kind of um, um, a congenital writer in some, <laughs> in some ways. And reading, of course, had, you know, a lot to do with that. Mm. This question makes me think about learning English. I, I grew up speaking um, Bengali, which is my mother tongue, and I was so afraid of having to learn English, which was something that I realized very early I would have to do. Did you speak English at home, Patricia? We spoke Spanish. My parents always spoke Spanish to us, but my brother is older, so he was in school ahead of me, so he came home speaking English. Mm. You know. Did you have that? Did you have that terror of English that I did, or no? You were just with people who were speaking English outside the home all the time. You know, um, I was naive enough to never know that I was different until people pointed it out to me. Mm -hmm. I do remember when I was in elementary school that um, kids would make fun of the way I pronounced L, the let things with the letter L, mm -hmm. and I didn't understand why. You know, <laughs> so um, I didn't have a fear. That's, that's kind of the thing until people started to, you know, mm. want, want to make me feel, you know, different. Mm. I guess I kind of had this, I was just like, what is this language? I don't know it. It's foreign. All the books that I see in English have, you know, blonde kids who are building sand castles on the beach, which is an activity I have never done. Um, so, you know, it was, I think for me, it was so much about realizing that the world I lived in could be represented in English, you know, even though I wasn't, um, we were reading a lot of Enid Blyton and all of these like British books. And we had these like Russian folk tales that I was reading when I was a kid. Um, but I also had this Atlas that I loved when I was a kid. And so it was just an amalgamation of all of those and realizing that English can fit into so many different kinds of stories. That was, I think, a, a key revelation for me. Um, okay, here's a question from Alex. Hi, Alex. Um, Patricia, I love how your book explores the interiority of Mauro and Elena in particular, and how you show the doubts they feel after migrating. Why did you decide to focus on keeping that present in their thoughts? Um, hi, Alex. Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, I think because that to me is a huge part of being a person who emigrates it is the, the, the nuances of, first of all, the, the deep longing, the homesickness, uh, the wondering if you made the right decision or if you just should just pack it up and go back home because your life <laughs> that you left continues without you. 
and it's deeply painful and it's a huge burden to bear for someone to be the one who leaves the homeland and you know changes the course of their family history forever. And that's something that um, I guess I hadn't seen so much in, in other books that are writing about uh, families who are, who are um, leaving one country um, for another. I, it, it's more about the events, it's less about the events happening and more about the internal journey that's required on a daily basis to repeatedly make the decision to stay. It's not just a one day decision and yeah, it's done and you don't look back. It's a daily decision, you know, to say, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay. So yeah, that was something that I wanted to, I wanted to go deeper into. Yeah, um, that's, such a, that's such a great question. Also because I'm thinking about how, um, I think there's a line in the book about how Elena dreams of being back in Colombia. She dreams that um, at the end of her life, um, you know, when she's in her last days, she will be back in Colombia. And that pull toward home while making the choice, as you say, to stay every day in a new place, um, it's such a difficult thing to write about. And it's such a, yeah, it's such a fundamental tension, I think, in, in so many immigrants' lives. And it's something that um, we don't see very much. So I'm, I'm very glad that this tension is one of the, definitely one of the engines of this book because this family is, is literally split. Um, yeah. Let me glance at the chat. Um, Here's a question from Mattia. How long did it take to write Infinite Country? Um, well, it's hard to say because I think of writing is not just like sitting in the chair and writing, you know, calendar time. I think so much of writing happens before you even get close to the chair, right? It's when you're thinking about the story and dreaming about it. So that, the, the early cells of the story go back maybe 10 years or so, but I didn't actually sit down uh, to write. And I sit down to write with the notes I've been writing over the previous few years <laughs> um, until 2018, at which point I um, wrote a very quick first draft. I say quick for me, uh, it took four months. And then I started the, rigorous process of revising and editing into, you know, um, into what it is now. So, um, yeah, I guess, it, you know, all in all, the actual, uh, a friend of mine, Daniel Chacon calls it like button chair time <laughs> of writing <laughs> was like, I don't know, maybe two years. <laughs> wow. Um... Here's a question from Emma, which I think will be our last question for the night. Um, I devoured both Infinite Country and The Burning, so this question is for both of you. Did you know how your characters' stories would end when you began writing your books, or did that vision develop along the way? Um, I'm curious to hear your response, uh, Mega. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I can go. Um, I think for me, I had a I had a vision of the of the structure where there would be kind of one downward arc and these two upward arcs. So I knew the general movement, um, the precise endpoints. You know, I wrote beyond what's in the book and kind of cut back and stuff like that. So finding the precise place where I would leave the characters took some time and some work, um, but I knew the shape of their stories. Yeah. Um, in my case for Infinite Country, I, I had, a sense, and I have to say that usually when I when I'm like writing a book or getting close to the end, I don't know exactly how it's going to end. I just know the feeling I want it to have. So it's almost like this emotional map that I have for it, or this emotional blueprint, and then I kind of find the actual scenes and language after. So I had an idea, I, but I it's not you know wasn't so precise. 
I love that emotional map. I'm going to be thinking about that. Um, well, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Everybody by Infinite Country from McNally Jackson right away. I think Maris put the link in there. Click it before the Zoom closes. Um, and thank you so much, Maris. Thanks to you both. This has been what a fun and fascinating evening. Um, Mega and Patricia, thank you. Um, please buy their books. Uh, and thank you to this audience. And thank you, Maris and Mega McNally Jackson. Can't wait to be back with you in person. And thanks for everybody who came and joined us tonight. Good night. <laughs> Bye.